Okay, um, well my name is Cheryl Burgess, um, I'm a research fellow at Stirling University. Um, first of all I'd like to say thank you very much for giving us this opportunity to come and talk to you um, about the work that's been going on now in partnership with Action for Children over a period of about five or six years. Um, and this is work that Bridget Daniel and James Scott, who's with me today, um, started and which I've sort of joined over the last couple of years. And this is research work which is ongoing, so we will be um, continuing to conduct our, our work with Action for Children as long as we've got funding to do it. Um, I suppose our sort of contribution to this is really about setting the scene for you. Um, although it's quite daunting to be the first speaker, it's also quite good because it means that after this Jane and I can relax and enjoy the rest of the day and it does sound as if you've got a really varied programme. Um, so really what I'll do is just outline the work that we've been doing with Action for Children, um, some of the things that we found out, and try and draw out some of the key points that we think are particularly relevant for people who are working in a kind of rural environment. But we do think there's also a lot of commonalities, that even though obviously there are some constraints that you have working in a rural setting, there are a lot of things that are actually just the same as whatever environment you're working in. Um, okay, let's see if we can... Get this to move on. Hang on to that one. Okay, great, thanks. Well, Action for Children have got a campaign um, to try and improve the situation for children who are neglected. Um, and they've commissioned a lot of research over the years. One, one particular um, project that I'd like to sort of particularly draw to your attention is one that they undertook in 2008. And as a result of that, they produced a report called Seen and Now Heard. And they did actually go out and talk with children in primary schools to try and get some sort of understanding of what children think of as neglect. Um, and what they found from that was that children from the age of eight <coughs> can recognise when their peers are experiencing neglect. And they said that they thought as many as three children a year in their class were children who they would think of as experiencing neglect. So I suppose that's quite sort of telling in a way that if, even if children themselves can tell when their peers are um, experiencing neglect, then, then obviously as adults we should be able to. Um, Following on from that, Jane and Bridget were involved with Action for Children staff in um, a piece of work that was funded by the Department of Health and the DSF, DSFC. And it was part of the Res Safeguarding Children Research Initiative, and it was called Recognising and Helping the ne Neglected Child. Um, and what they did for that project was they, they went out and talked to families, they went talked to children and young people, they did a literature search, actually, of what, what we know about how children and parents, <coughs> how we can make it easier for them to seek help, because obviously one of the things we know about neglect is that parents, oh, well first of all they may not realise that the care of their children isn't really um, up to scratch, but also they just find it really hard to go and ask for help, and that we feel that there must be more things that they could do, to, that we could do as, as, our, as professionals to make it easier for them. Um, there was then the neglect training materials which have been um, funded by the Department for Education and these are actually going to, uh, just in the process of being updated um, for the Scottish context and they are very good training materials, there will be a link to them at the end of the presentation and if you haven't seen them already I would, it's really worth going and having a look at them because there are lots of really useful exercises and information that you can do when you're talking with people about neglect and training other professionals um, but it's probably worth hanging on for the, for the Scottish version. Um, and then, mainly what my talk's going to be about this morning, and then and Jane following on from me, is, is about this, the UK and the Scottish reviews of child neglect that we've been undertaking. And I'll also tell you a bit about our Action on Neglect resource pack, which we've just finished. And although that was set very much in the English context, we think there are a lot of things that are common for, for Scotland too. Which one is it again? <laughs> <laughs> no. Blank. It's just this one. Oh, it's that one. Okay. 
Okay, so the, the point of doing the um, neglect reviews, the UK-wide neglect reviews, and we're, we're just starting our third one now, um, is to try and set some sort of baseline, really, about how things are for neglected children across the UK. Um, and then to follow on each year to try and see how things hopefully either improve for them or possibly not, <coughs> given that we've all got massive constraints with funding. Um, the second review, second annual review, oh, the, the, then we followed up the first UK review with what we called the Scottish Extension, and this concentrated much more on what was happening in Scotland, and we came out and did a lot of focus groups across Scotland. That was the reason we were, we were up here. And... Um, so that we and we produced a report for the Scottish Government which just tried to sort of show the picture really of how things were in Scotland for children who were either experiencing neglect or at risk of experiencing neglect. Um, the second review which we did last year, um, we focused in much more on universal services because in the first review we heard a lot about what targeted services and what statutory services do. But we thought given the emphasis now on universal services, that's health, schools, um, police, housing, just all those services that every, most people receive. Um, there's a big emphasis now on, on universal services doing as much as they can to avoid families becoming involved with the statutory services. So we tried to get a picture of what universal services are doing and also just to pick up on any of the sort of difficulties with that because clearly, um, you know, there are high expectations on universal services anyway and quite a lot of anxiety about whether teachers are in a position to be providing some of the, the, the things, the support that we're expecting of them. This current review, which we're just starting, is actually going to focus now on um, children and parents themselves. So we're going to go out and do focus groups with Action for Children staff to find out what children and parents need from us. Um, and I'll speak a bit, we did some of that work on the Action on Neglect um, project, so I'll speak a bit more about that in a minute. Okay, I think, I mean, I, I'm not going to sort of go on about what neglect is, because obviously you all know that, um, I would think, by now, and you know all the definitions and things. Um, but I suppose it's, especially at the beginning of a day like this, it's always worth just reminding ourselves, really, of, of the implications of, for children of, of being neglected. Um, I won't read this out. I mean, you, you've probably heard it already. But basically, neglect can have you know, a, a much sort of deeper effect on young people than um, physical sexual abuse. Um, and quite often it goes in, um, together with physical and sexual abuse. So it does have big implications for children, not just making them miserable in the short term, but also on their future relationships. Um, so I think, I think it's just really important to keep reminding ourselves just how important it is that we try and um, ameliorate the effects or prevent neglect. Okay, so I'll just tell you a bit about what the reviews are and how we collect the information. Um, the reviews... All right, okay. Sorry. I'm never going to remember that. I've just got a total block about it now. Um, the reviews are, are kind of an evolving process, if you like. I mean, we do want to be able to... Because we've done our baseline, we do want to be able to see how things are moving on for children. But we don't feel that we can keep going back and asking people the same questions because quite often things don't change within a year. Um, so we've got a sort of core bit to our review, but we're also... Um, have, try and have a different focus each year, as, as I described just now. So we, we gather the information by survey, or we've gathered up to now the information by survey questionnaires, which we've sent out to child protection leads and the local safeguarding children boards in England and the health and social care boards in Northern Ireland. Action for Children also commission YouGov polls each time that we do the review, just to ask the public what they think um, about you know, how many children they think they see each year who have been neglected and whether they've got what whether they know what to then do who to contact um, but also to um, find out whether they've got faith in professionals that they will do something about it then we've got our focus groups and our focus groups are always multi-agency and we found actually that bringing people together across agencies has been really fruitful quite often people don't get the opportunity to come together to talk about general issues such as neglect, they come together to talk about specific families. So, I mean, we've, we have 
found from feedback that people have really valued the opportunity just to talk to each other and obviously it gives us useful information too. Um, we've also undertaken sort of policy document reviews, Jane always does those, um, and I mean things are changing in the policy world fairly frequently as you'll know. Um, and as I say, we, we do try and do something a bit different every year with the reviews as well, just to make it more interesting for people. But I should say that the focus groups, we do make quite a big um, effort to have focus groups in different types of areas. So many of our focus groups have been in areas where there's quite a large rural population. So we have attempted to sort of bring out some of the, um, the particular sort of constraints and difficulties, but also some of the strengths, actually, about working in rural areas. Aha, uh -huh, it worked. <laughs> I'm getting there. Okay, so our main questions in the reviews are um, just about how many children are being neglected, um, also are we able to identify them, and what are we doing to help them, and how can we do this better? And in an overall kind of way, the answers to these are that it is really hard to know how many children are being neglected. And obviously we've got numbers from the child protection registers there, the kind of um, the top tip of the iceberg. It's very, very hard to get from local authorities how many families they're working with where neglect is probably an issue. Um, I don't quite, I think it's quite complex actually trying to collect data. I mean, it would be good to come up with some system that we could across Scotland, for example, given that it's a small country, um, do this in a, in, a, in a way that would help us to plan services better, to know the extent of the problem that we've, we've got to deal with. But it is tricky. And I'll say a bit more about that in a minute. Um, across Scotland and the UK, we are definitely better at identifying um, children who are possibly experiencing neglect. I mean, there has been a lot of training, there are a lot of awareness raising exercises, there's lots of material that people can draw on. Um, so I don't, we, we don't think that's so much the issue. It's, it's more the kind of thing about at what point do you act and how do you act, and I'll say a bit more about that in a minute. Um, and in terms of help, there is a lot going on. I mean, as we went around to different areas, we were quite impressed, really, with all the, the different little patches of things that people are are doing to help families, support families, to try and prevent things escalating. Um, but it, it comes back to the thing about trying to do more earlier on, and that's always a knotty problem when you have got families obviously up at the high end who you have to help, and then the others kind of get pushed back. So it's the, the, the perennial problem, really. So, yeah, just a slide about the, the sort of numbers thing um, and how you know, complex it is to collect material. Um, and children who are at risk do often are categorised under so many different headings. You'll have um, headings about um, parental capacity and lack of per parenting help, you know, for, the, for, the, um, for some purposes. Then you'll have referral information and it all comes in in different forms. Um, so it is really quite hard to, to quantify and so you've got the sort of the neglect in capital letters, the, the small number at the top, but you've also got that very broad swathe of, of neglect, which are, and those are the children that people tend to worry about because they may perhaps don't quite fit the criteria for the child protection system or even for statutory help, but they're the kind of children that teachers go home and sort of worry about at night. Um, we're not very good at identifying numbers through um, information from adult services who are working with adults who may have problems that do potentially um, could lead to neglect for children. Um, we do need to find some way of collecting information in a way that doesn't entail double counting so that we do know the extent of the problem. Otherwise, we, we wonder just how we can plan services effectively. I mean, but I know there are constraints anyway about budgeting and things, so I mean, it's perhaps being a bit idealistic to think that we could. Um, in terms of identification, we, we did ask questions about definitions of neglect, and it does appear that, that in general, the definitions are shared across agencies. But it's, it is more about this whole sort of horrible word, word thresholds kind of issue. Um, and... 
it's, I, I suppose what we've come to think is that it's partly about assessing the severity of neglect and the associated harm for the child, but it's also about bringing in the thing about the likelihood of the parent actually accepting help and being prepared to make changes. So both those things have to come into play about deciding how and when to act. Um, so it may be that you have a child who's ex what we, experiencing what we think is quite severe neglect, but we do we feel that we can kind of get in there, if you like, and um, try and persuade the parent to work with us on a voluntary basis. And in some respects, that's not quite as serious as a child who's experiencing what we might think of as sort of lower level neglect, um, but we're pretty sure that the parent isn't going to um, accept the help that we're offering. Um, one of the things that we, we spoke, or people spoke to us about, about identification is that it, it's about finding the, the opportunities, really, to sort of pick up, tune into a child, was a, a phrase that somebody used. And just, I suppose that's one of the things where universal services, who are seeing, especially teachers who are seeing children every day, can really do that and actually notice those little subtle, or maybe not so subtle, changes. And, and just try and build in those opportunities and ways of speaking with children to actually find out what's going on. Um, in terms of identification, there does seem to be uh, quite a lot of um, evidence out there that services are working together better. And, I mean, part of this is perhaps about the kind of GERFEC developments in Scotland and all the kind of multi-agency groups that have been set up. But also, I think... Um, it seems to be working, from what we heard, it seems to be working better in places where those relationships were kind of there already. Um, and I think, well, we came to the conclusion anyway, that it, actually in rural areas you do have that opportunity, if you like, that you quite often do have good working relationships with each other. You're maybe working together more often o over the, a sort of smaller number of cases. And you've maybe got more continuity of staff. There's possibly less sort of turnover. And you can build on that, really, to, to work together as um, well across agencies. So I would say that was definitely something that is, is a positive. I mean, that your experience may be different, but that is what we came across in the focus groups that we um, people spoke to us about. OK, to sort of bring this in a bit more to some of the key issues for people working in a rural setting, um, when we looked at, what, at services and, and sort of what we do to actually help children, um, I suppose one of the things that struck us is that actually universal services are likely to be much more important in rural areas because you may not have much else. You know, you're not going to have all these sort of perhaps as many targeted services. Um, so actually it does come down much more to people who are working within the kind of universal setting. Um, what we found was that, that midwives are, are perhaps picking up children at an earlier stage, you know, a very early stage before they're born, um, and that some areas have actually done what they can to supplement health visitor services by bringing in sort of like, almost like a family assistant type role, so that, that they can actually go out and do the kind of hands-on work with families and leave the health visitors to sort of make the visits. Um, but obviously there are still gaps in this, and I mean one of the things you know that we worry about is that there aren't enough people going into homes, really, and that families are, uh, at an early stage when they're involved with health visitors are going into clinics, maybe seeing different health visitors, and there isn't that continuity that um, that would would help that situation. Um, we across the UK we came up with example, really good examples of what schools were doing to help children and to also offer a lot of parents support to parents so within school you'd have things like nurture groups which do seem to to work really well um, but also schools had become in some areas this is particularly down in England had become a real hub for the community because they'd made themselves very accessible and approachable and had fam a family support worker who was really welcoming to parents, they were actually coming in about all sorts of things. And it wasn't just about the children and their education. It was about um, housing issues, debt issues. And obviously that family support worker in the, within the school can't do everything, but they can build that relationship with the parent where they would feel okay about going out to other agencies. They would maybe take them to the other agencies. 
Um, but I suppose one thing that schools were saying to us that there isn't enough therapy for children who've already experienced neglect, and I mean that's you know there's a, a massive need there. I suppose one of the things that really struck me was that you can have this vast array of services and lots of um, targeted services, many of which actually don't last long anyway and may be around for just two years or whatever, um, but that you won't get anywhere with these services unless what you're offering to parents is acceptable to them. Um, and so you have to make these services very non-stigmatising, very accessible. There needs to be some sort of flexibility and workers just need to be incredibly persistent. Um, I mean, these are all things that you'll know. But the other thing I suppose that's really important is that we do know that families where there's kind of entrenched neglect, you, they need long-term help um, in some situations. And we really need to make that available. So what people need is, is the relationship. And I think this is one of the things that I'm going to kind of argue as, as I go on for a little bit longer, um, is that actually it doesn't matter where you are, whether you're in a city or whether you're in a village or a small town, it's actually the relationship. If, you, if one person can make that relationship with a, with a parent, then that will make all the difference. Okay. Um, so I'm not saying that targeted help isn't invaluable. And obviously, if you're working in an area which is very short of services, you're probably going to wish that you had some of these targeted um, services. And I, I suppose that also means that more people are involved with the family and can keep an eye on what's going on. And they're also likely, staff working for targeted services are likely to have more time to spend with a family. Um, but I think it's not just about that, really. So in general, what we found was that we're not very good at measuring whether what we do is actually having an, a, a good outcome for children. I mean, obviously, if children go into foster care, we can assume that they're safe. But I mean, obviously, we know that some foster placements are very good, but it doesn't work out too well for others. But actually, most areas are trying to develop ways of measuring whether what they do makes a difference for children. But I, I mean, again, that's, that's pretty complex, I would say, and can tend to be a bit simplistic. Um, as we travelled across the country, we saw that there were loads of examples of good practice of, of working with families. And what seems a shame is that we're not sharing them more and that we continuously sort of reinvent things. And then, I mean, it would be really good to have some sort of way in which we can all share what we're doing and learn from each other. Another sort of general thing that we found was that um, people were very worried, really, about the whole sort of court system and the children's hearing system and just feeling that um, sheriffs and lawyers and all the people kind of working within those systems hadn't really grasped the, the kind of consequences of the impact of neglect on children and, and I mean it would be very good if we could kind of influence even in terms of them getting more training um, just so that the kind of crazy decisions that get made when people have gathered all the evidence and then the child goes back home so it's, it's, it's just about educating people really okay so what gets in the way um, As I said earlier, we do need more people going into the house, I think, just to see what's going on with the family. And actually, that was something that some of the schools were doing, because they had family support workers, that there was a kind of legitimate reason to be going into the house. And parents did seem to find that, or some of them, more acceptable, and that, and that was a kind of in, really. Um, thresholds always get in the way. The whole thing about gathering evidence, we just have to be really smart, I think, about how we analyse things and gather evidence. Um, and obviously people are always going to help the child who they feel is in most need and especially when services are there's constraints on services and funding difficulties um, but I suppose it's always about taking ourselves back to thinking about how that child is feeling in that particular setting and, and seeing it very much from the child and thinking okay that child may not seem as deserving as another one but what does it actually feel like for that child day in, day out, and is there something I can do, even if it's not something major, a major referral or something, or discussion, is there some small thing that can actually make day-to-day -day life easier for the child? Because people do get desensitised, um, and we heard this in a lot of places, that 
you know, you can move from working in one area to another and be quite shocked that things that wouldn't have been acceptable in one area are acceptable in another, and it's about continuously challenging that, I think. Um, and obviously there are a lot of parents out, out there who, whatever sort of good relationship we, we persistently try and make with them, are just not going to accept help, and there'll be all sorts of reasons for that. Um, we're also not really clear about what's being asked of them, and that is something that came across to us in the groups we did with parents. Um, and there is quite a lot of work and quite a lot of writing going on at the moment about how we can try and help or work with parents who are um, resistant. And actually, if you go to the link at the end with our action on neglect pack, there are links within that pack which can give you some sort of pointers of, of where to look for help with that. Right, well, I'll just very quickly say something about the action on neglect work. Um, I won't tell you too much about what we did. We basically met with um, multi-agency practitioners over four meetings, but we also had a consultant group of young people and parents. Um, and I'll tell you just a little bit about what the young people and parents said to us, because actually that's the bit that people have found really interesting. Um, overall, there are some very interesting differences, in, I would say, in how young people and parents viewed neglect. But what was other, also interesting was that there were similarities in what they wanted out of professionals, so I'll, I'll run through that. And as I said before, there are commonalities there. It doesn't really matter whether you're working in an urban setting or, or in a, a small village. Okay, so, um, I mean, you can read this for yourself. You've got it in the pack. Young people, overall, they talk to us about um, the emotional aspects of neglect, the social aspects of neglect, time parents not spending time, not having an interest, um, parents neglecting themselves, which we thought was really perceptive of, of young people. Um, and as it says at the bottom, love is a doing word. It's okay to say I love my kids, but you've actually got to sort of prove it in some way. Um, what does neglect feel like? Again, you can read that for yourselves. It's things that you would probably um, guess. All the things about having no friends, having to cover everything up, um, the sort of school issues about getting told off. And I think what came over to us from young people was that they, a lot of them felt that they'd been left at home too long. They couldn't understand why professionals could actually see what was going on in the house. Some of them could tell that their parents weren't going to be able to change and it just sort of mystified them that it took several years for them to move into foster care. And it was obviously the ones that were in good foster placements who were more likely to feel this. But when they did get into a good foster placement, they felt that their life had really started. It was quite stark. Um, parents, they talked to, we, we asked them about what they thought neglect was. Um, there were some sort of emotional and social things, but there was also quite a lot of material things that they talked about. Um, not having enough money, what sort of, you know, giving them pasta all the time was something that they spoke about a lot. Um, they very much saw neglect, and, and the other thing was that they did seem quite confused about what professionals wanted out of them. So I think there's a message there about being very clear about what are the, the, the small steps that people need to take to improve the situation for their children, and just about speaking in clear, plain language. Um, so what we did, and it's in the Action on Neglect Pack, pack is we, we wrote letters to professionals from the young people and the parents. We read it out to them. They made any changes that they want us to make. And, I mean, they are quite powerful letters. Um, so if you get a chance, have a look at the link for the Action on Neglect Pack. And if you don't look at anything else, look at the letters from young people and parents. What... Um, they wanted from their professionals, they wanted people to be professional. Um, so they did want that kind of empathy, but they didn't want people to be too chummy. And that was something that the young people said, that they can actually feel really stifled if they've got someone who's just wanting to be their pal. Um, so they need to have um, faith in people that they can actually change things. So it's that sort of mix, really, of, of the empathy, but also being very sort of firm and clear. They want someone who listens. Well, we hear that all the time. Um, and I think it's really important. We want, they want people who are very accessible to them, and, and obviously that's quite difficult when you're a busy social worker and you, they have to leave messages, but they do want people to, to be available for them. They do want people to be honest and very clear about what they need to do. 
Um, and I suppose the other thing that came over, and it's in the letter, is that they do need that little glimmer of hope that, they, that their things can change for them, but with realism. I mean, I think that's the thing about being clear, is trying to give that message of hope, but also saying you have to do this, 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 and this, or this will happen. So parents accepted that, they recognised that. Okay, I've got to let Jane speak next. Um, so finally, I suppose my overall message really is that we've got all these systems, um, we've got all these projects, we've, we've set all these things up, but actually, although all those things are important, it's actually the individuals who make the difference. And I mean, you'll know this if you're out in practice, that it's all about building that relationship, and in a sense, that it doesn't actually matter where you are, whether you're in a city or whether you're in a, a small town. And I suppose that's my kind of message of hope, really, in, in, in these difficult times. Okay, let's over to Jane. Before you go, which button is it? All oh, right. <laughs> I think I've got it now. That one. Great, thanks. I just want to say um, thank you so much for the invitation. When I got to my hotel last night, I was booked in as Dame Jane Scott. So <laughs> thank you, colleagues, for my promotion, and thank you for the fabulous room I had last night. <laughs> I just wanted to focus in the last kind of 10 minutes that we've got around some of the, the particular issues that people might be facing working within rural communities. We're certainly not saying that neglect is any more prevalent in rural communities than in urban communities. Um, we're certainly not saying that there are different issues that people face and that families face, but maybe perhaps living in a rural community puts that in a different focus and a slightly different um, a, attention on it. But I thought before um, we started to talk about the issues, I would have a little look and just check and see what was the current definition around rural and urban areas. And as you see, most of the areas represented probably have this mix of accessible rural and remote rural. I'm glad that these are in your packs because that's actually quite small. But remote rural being settlements of less than 3,000 people and within a drive time, which I think is really important, of over 30 minutes to a settlement of 10,000 or more. And when I looked just in this area of Murray, and do correct me if I'm wrong, it's only Elgin, I think, that has a large population. The rest, um, Banff, Bucky, Forest, they're all around about seven, eight and, and, and less. So you are talking a mix of accessible rural, but this remote rural, and I know I just looked at Murray, the stats are available for all the other areas, but other areas represented probably are having to work with that combination. The other thing I looked at was just in terms of population, the integration agenda, the move to public protection. And at the moment in 2011, that's the population here. And you can see that by and large, it's just above, just below the national average. But the population statistics also look at what might happen in 2035, in a few years, well, quite a few years' time. What really surprised me was that your ageing population, and if you think around the issues for adult protection, is set to double in this area, which actually has a massive implication the other big population group set to increase, in line with the national statistics of about 10%, is also this population of 0 to 15. So you've got two quite um, populations that probably have quite a, an impact on your services here, but particularly this doubling. And I'd be very interested in other areas. I only did it because um, I didn't want to do every area that's represented here. But it would be interesting to know what kind of impact will that have, because you'll work across boundaries anyway. Um, you're not just limited to, to geographical. So, what does it mean? It was really interesting. We've taken information from the focus groups, from the research that we've done over the number of years, but I also did a kind of wider look at some other um, services and some of the literature that's around in terms of setting up and working within rural areas. One of the key things, and I think this happens in terms of employment, uh, it happens in cities, but it's the, it's the two weeks at home, the two weeks away, the three weeks at home, the three weeks on the rig. <coughs> what it does do, I think, for some families and for some children, is to an extent mask what is happening, particularly what happens when that parent comes back with money in their pocket, out on a bender, there might be issues of domestic abuse. So for a period of time in that child's life, 
they are experiencing a more predictable, more routine three or four weeks with the one parent, things are a bit more stable. And then there's three or four weeks where there's a bit of chaos. Then it goes back to being a bit stable. So actually, we may not be picking up. It's not an increase that's happening on an incremental basis. It's stop, start. So you think things are getting better, things are fine. But actually, what's really happening is, to some extent, it's masking. Now, of course, people in cities work away for two weeks, work away for three weeks, and come home again. But I think it's, it's certainly an issue where unemployment and the opportunities of unemployment are probably different within rural communities. <coughs> The other issue I won't talk too much about mentioned was the fuel poverty and how difficult and how expensive that's becoming for all of us and particularly within rural communities. But in terms of transport links, if you look at the literature it will say rural communities who are transport links. Actually, I think it's a more complicated picture and I know from where I live in a rural community down in East Lothian, it's the inconsistency of transport links. It's the chopping and the changing. It's the contract goes to one transport link, then it doesn't work out, so it goes to another. One week I've got a bus, the next week I haven't. How do I get to my GP? How do I get my kids to a dentist, even if I wanted to? And there, there I have a reason for not taking my kids. So it is, these changes really, really impact in a rural community, both for your elderly population, as well as for, for population and uh, younger people. The other question that came up in our focus groups, and I only pose it as a question here, is when people were talking about um, substance misuse and drug and alcohol, what they reported was an increase in the combination of alcohol and prescription uh, um, drugs. I don't know if that's something that's reflected in your area here. But I think what workers were saying to us, we don't actually challenge enough the use of alcohol. And now, I mean, I think that's an issue for Scotland right across the board. Um, so I don't think that's necessarily something that, that is rural. But it certainly came through more from workers within um, our focus groups in rural communities that there was a feeling of we maybe really don't challenge this enough and maybe we should be doing something more. In the... Um, in our, our focus groups, and there was about three or four actually of the focus groups which were in, in communities, um, they talked about two different, crudely, talked about two different sorts of families, if you like. There was the families who'd had roots in the community for years and years and years, and there was those families who had moved in. And that, that distinction was a lot more apparent um, within uh, the focus groups <coughs> here and in other places. One of the the, the, the things that came through to us, and again, it's the masking of this problem, is that something happens, mum and dad, they're unavailable for a month, they're away in a bender again. What happens is the kids go to granny, granddad, auntie, uncle, cousins. The family continue to look after them. The kids are fine, the kids are okay. And then mum and dad are available, they're back on board, and they're back within the family home. So the kids are coping, the kids are doing fine, but are they doing fine enough? if you see what I mean. And that is, it, it's, they're looked after within the family, but what's happening is they're experiencing some degree of neglect and are the issues that are causing it actually being tackled? Now, these families may not be known to you, so it's not about professionals not doing enough. It's just sometimes how do we get to know about these families where they're being looked after by that wider, um, by that wider family. And again, and I think this is a really interesting one, there was a study done in 2006 by University of Aberdeen, health colleagues within University of Aberdeen, and what came out from that study is that a lot of health workers do go back to the areas they were born and brought up in. So there is something, it's not just saying, I've known that family for years in a professional capacity, actually, I might have known that family for years in a, a personal capacity, and they might have known you. And that came really um, home to me, because uh, my parents are down in Dumfries and Galloway, needed to go to the GP, sat down, looked up, and I realised, last time I saw you, you were in first year, and I was a really mature, elegant sixth year. <laughs> I didn't have anything to do with you. You were the youngest brother of a friend of mine. Now, it was fine. I was only there for a routine thing. It was, it was, but I did feel a bit uncomfortable. I wasn't being asked about my parenting. I wasn't being questioned about my mental health. I didn't have to talk about my substance misuse. So 
it just brought it home that actually it's not to say that it shouldn't be happening but it's just to be aware of that that sometimes what you're bringing into the room is some of that personal history that goes way back again in terms of and I mean there's a lot of literature there's been a lot of discussion families who are new to communities a lot of people say they're running away they think they're going to be able to hide within a rural setting leaving all the problems behind problems become more visible this community that they've moved into might be quite suspicious of why they've been running away and suspicious of the family they're more isolated and not getting the support that's all well known but I think what we might have to pay some attention to is the huge experience of loss that children within those families are feeling from what they've left behind, sometimes very, very quickly. Their school, their networks, their friends, their mates, playing football down in the park, and suddenly that's gone from them. They may not always know the reasons why. So sometimes, some of those families that you're working with, it's that sense of loss um, for children in particular, in addition to... Uh, the isolation and the suspicion that the families may be feeling. For workers, you'll notice yourself, visibility within the community is both really good and can be at times not quite so comfortable. You will have a really good knowledge of your communities. You will have a, we feel, really good professional, that's come through in the, in the, in the focus groups, really good professional relationships. Um, which work very, very well in getting things moving quite quickly. You can respond. There's identifiable networks that you can work through in terms of, of families and children who might be experiencing neglect. But it can be really difficult working in small communities. And having that balance between a life within work and a life outside of work and who you meet when you're down at Lidl and Aldi and Tesco or wherever doing your shopping. One study that was done was actually done in Australia, and I mentioned it. These bits of decision making will be the same, you know, wherever you're making a decision. They identified these four stages of being alerted to the possibility of abuse and neglect, the kind of bit of waiting and gathering of evidence, making a decision and acting. But what the, what the study found out in rural um, Australia was it was this second stage of the waiting and the gathering of evidence that seemed to be impacted, it took much longer in terms of, or impacted by the fact it was within a rural community. And what they said and what their conclusion was, it was this need to feel certain. You need to feel certain. It was compounded, compounded by the rural setting. It was the closeness of the community, the visibility of the professional, and the impact of your decisions on the family and possibly some of that wider family network. So it wasn't saying that people weren't doing exactly the same stages everywhere else, but this second stage was quite often protracted, and there was concerns then about what was happening to the children in that stage. Quite often, uh, workers were really seeking reassurance, so quite often went to others to confirm their decisions, um, and that was where the role of supervision became really important for workers working within rural communities. Am I making the right decision based on the information I know now? In hindsight, it might not have been the right decision, but is it the right decision now in terms of what we know? So, for services, what does this mean? Couldn't emphasise more in terms of what Cheryl was saying, the important role of the health visiting. School nurses have come through in our research as really, really important and key figures as well. It's a really delicate balance between having local, flexible, accessible services, but those that actually require that greater funding and that more specialist knowledge, which are often in, in central areas. The gap that some people have said is actually there are some services around mental health and substance misuse for parents, but the gap that people have expressed is for young people. It's the, it's the services in terms of young people mental health and young people's substance misuse and are there programmes in places. A lot of the literature will say a very stark rural areas, less services, less accessible services. Actually, we found from our focus group that people were saying there's quite a lot going on and there's quite, what we need to know is what is going on because it's the coordination and it's the information 
because of some of the rural nature of, of, the, folk, of the, the areas we looked at, some services come through quite different routes. Church groups, for example, there's still quite strong connections through the church. Church groups will emerge and offer a service locally to support young mums. There can be other things through the um, third sector, voluntary sector. In, I never know quite what to call it, which is the right phase at the right time. But um, that quite a lot of services come through the third sector, and it's about that coordination. It was much more about the coordination and being clear about what services are in place, as opposed to there are... Everybody said they wanted more services. That was true, but there were services available. The other thing that came through from some of the literature which is really interesting is new projects. That actually being in a rural area, new projects can take much longer to embed and they're just beginning to get going when the funding period ends. So it's about thinking maybe a bit more, a bit differently, a bit more creative, that if, if new projects are setting up, giving it that longer lead-in time. And this was an evaluation that was done of domestic abuse services. Now, there may be some issues around domestic abuse in rural communities and being quite visible that there's issues going on at home. But nevertheless, I think there is a message that in rural areas it can take longer, and that just needs to be built in before funding is pulled and the service is gone. And again... Services being reliant on one or two individuals, one or two therapeutic services, fantastic. Person moves, service goes. And I think in rural communities, you're probably more at risk of that happening. So very quickly and to finish, some of the big national initiatives that have been picked up on was the use of local media, directories of information, and also really good partnerships with local transport links so that they could almost plan kind of local changes and impacts of what was happening. And just to say, and because we're in Murray, and I know there's others represented, um, what colleagues from across services was they, they actually they felt pretty confident in recognising neglect. What they had more mixed views about was evidencing neglect and getting others to listen to that evidence, particularly, as um, Cheryl has said, in the courts and the children's hearing to some extent. How do you do that? And actually, how do you make the links? This child needs speech and language development and support. But is that neglect? Is it because of neglect? How do we make the links across the services? So it's that evidencing of neglect. The other thing that we did pick up from Murray was that there was actually a really good feeling of good relationships. I do remember the focus groups where there was a lot of laughter. I always think that's quite a good thing. I don't think they were laughing at each other. Um, and there was, a, there was a healthy acknowledgement of the cuts and the impact of cuts. I mean, it was there. There's no getting away from it. But there was a view of, this is where we are. We can't just talk about cuts all the times. So we need to try and do something about this and, and to work more creatively. When we asked if they wanted um, uh, what, what sort of services, lots came out. There was Studio 8, step-by-step -step groups to help um, adults confidence. The work that's done by nursery nurses, uh, Action for Children, Aberlour, the work that's done within education settings. These were mentioned uh, more particularly homeschool workers. Uh, is it Beyond Words? It is before words, that's fine. I suddenly thought I'd got the wrong name. Before words, GERFEC and your local interagency assessment process where a family or a professional can say, got some concerns, let's get round a table and talk about this and see if we can get some solutions to this family. We asked if you wanted any more services, you said more of everything, thank you very much. But in particular, Home Start, family support workers, and particular this services for teenagers. And I just want to finish with a quote. We get golden moments. If it hadn't been for the joint working from start to finish, these families would have lost their children. And I think that's the job that everybody's doing at the moment. Thank you.